All right, so let's get started on acute back pain. So um, you're gonna be shadowing me today in neurosurgery clinic. And as you might know, neurosurgery is brain and spine. So we don't just do surgery on people's skulls. We, I would say actually a majority of neurosurgery care ends up being um, back care. So for today, we're gonna see two patients together and we can see on their chief complaint and their um, scheduling form that they have back pain. So the first question I have when for you guys is, what possible diagnosis should run through your mind when you see back pain on a patient's chief complaint? So A, muscle strain, B, kidney stones, C, pneumonia, or D, a heart attack. So if you want to give me a couple of uh, answers, we'll see kind of what the majority is. I see a lot of A answers in the chat, A and B. Okay, good. Oh yeah, I see these popping in down here. I've got like 30 answers. Thanks for participating. So you guys are great. A is very smart choice, especially because I'm telling you we're in neurosurgery clinic, but the caveat is it's all four of them. Um, and every specialty you practice, even if you don't go into something for spine care, um, you're going to deal with patients who have back pain. And a lot of patients maybe will tell you what symptom they're having, and you might jump to just one conclusion, but you need to think outside the block box. So you can't be narrow-minded just because you work in one field, you can't think about other issues. And the answer would be all of them, because as you can see on this chart here, a lot of different conditions can radiate to the back and you can actually get clouded in your judgment of working up a, a disease state just because of back pain. So um, just something to keep in mind moving forward, even if you don't practice with spine patients. Oops. Okay, so patient number one for the day. Uh, on their form, it says that they've had low back pain for the last two weeks. They were referred by their chiropractor after their pain worsened with four different chiropractic sessions. Um, on their pain intake form, we give these to a lot of our patients to fill out and kind of show us where their pain is before we go and see them. And he has circled or put a square around his low back. This patient's name is John Smith. He is a 38-year-old male, and he has a BMI of 29.9, so it's just cueing us off that he's uh, an overweight gentleman. For his past medical history, he's just had a rotator cuff injury and has IBS. He is a social alcohol user, daily smoker, and his occupation is that he works in the Amazon warehouse production side. He does not currently take any medications. So for patient history, what are, like anything that you're thinking you wanna ask this patient when you walk in the room? Let's see if I can show your previews. Here we go. Okay, what's the heaviest weight he lifts on a daily basis? That's a good one. When did it begin? Great. Consciously aware of the injury. Scale of one to 10. Great, great choice. You always should put a pain scale. Any family history of back pain? Great. And taking any medication for the pain? These are all great questions. You guys are thinking along the right lines already. I like the person here who said constipation or blood in urine. Um, you're thinking outside the box and trying to make sure that they don't have something else going on with their kidneys just because they've walked into neurosurgery clinic. Any trauma or injury to the back? Perfect. What makes this pain worse or better? Great. I think those are a lot of great answers. We can move forward. Put this down here. So Old charts is something you might hear about if and when any of you enroll in your, your pre-health studies. And a lot of you covered these questions that you wanted to ask, but the mnemonic that we're taught in school is old charts, which would be onset, location, duration, characteristics, alleviating and aggravating factors, radiating and relieving, and timing and severity. So we do our patient interview with him, and he says it was two weeks ago. The pain is in his low back. It is constant, and he gets some relief when he reclines. His character characteristics of the pain is sharp stabbing, and he gets muscle spasms as well. 
Um, alleviating has been some NSAIDs and a heat pack, uh, gets him through the day and aggravating is all movements. He just doesn't want to move at all. Uh, it radiates just in a band across his entire low back. The timing, and this is kind of the important one, is that it occurred when he was lifting and twisting an Amazon box at work. His severity is a nine out of 10. He says this is the worst pain that he has ever had before. Move this down here. So a frequent thing we see in spine clinic is that chiropractors take x-rays for their patients when they're getting adjustments. And, um, you know, maybe they've seen them for the initial injury and the patients bring the x-rays to us. So he's like, I did these four sessions, my back's still hurting and he took x-rays and I brought them here for you to look at. Can you tell me what is wrong going on in my spine right now? Like clearly you have to see something here that explains why I'm in so much pain. So before we explain to him what we see, um, give me some answers in the chat box of what is x-ray utilized for in spine. This is a harder one and it's okay. If you have wrong answers, we learn by, by guessing. Okay. Arthritis. Perfect. Fractures, alignment, great. Bone and not soft tissue, perfect. Degeneration. To see the alignment, tumors, scoliosis. Bone spurs. Inflammation, bone fractures. Alignment, curvature. You guys are smart. So this one person here has herniated discs, and that is the important part of this slide is that you cannot see herniated discs on x-ray. X-ray is only great for bony anatomy. So we'll look at these two views here. He has a PA or AP view, just depending on how the, the image was taken. That means posterior anterior or anterior posterior view. So we're looking at him from the front and then a lateral view which is um, a sagittal cut as if we're looking at him from the side. And when we look at these x-rays, we're just making sure we can see that he has great alignment. Like you guys were saying that the holes, the neuroforamen look kind of open. We don't see anything, any bone spurs in any of these keyholes, which look great. The facet joints don't look too bad. They look appropriate for a, about a 40 year old man, not horrible arthritis. All of his disc height looks great. They look about uniform and even at every le uh, level. He doesn't have any bone spurs growing off the front. He doesn't have any compression fractures that would be smushing the bone down. So overall, glancing at these two, very normal x-rays. So just to go over the lumbar spine x-ray anatomy, unlike the things you guys said, Great for evaluating uh, the alignment, seeing if they have scoliosis, looking for a vertebra, uh, vertebral body slipping. That's called spondylolisthesis, big word that essentially just means sometimes our spine can become unstable and one vertebra can slip over another vertebra. Um, assessing degree of arthritis, like we said, looking for fractures and overall bone quality. So if someone has osteoporosis, their bones look very light, like very wispy looking um, if they don't have good bone quality. So you can tell a lot just from an x-ray. So right here, just kind of labeling and giving you guys uh, an overall gist of the spine is we, we count up from the sacrum. So this is S1, L5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And then we get to the thoracic spine here where you start to see uh, floating ribs as we get into the rib cage. Each one of these blocks here is the pedicle that connects our um, vertebral bodies to the lamina and the spinous process. So all of these wavy bits of bone are what you feel when you push on your back. This is, oh, let's go back. This is the lamina, and then you can barely see them. Spinous processes are thin, so they're normally this light. That's what you feel when you push on your back as the spinous processes. And you can see a little bit of the hip too, which can sometimes be helpful. So the iliac crust, and sometimes you get lucky and you can see the head of the femur on the view as well. But overall, the point of this is that x-rays are not good for anything to do with soft tissue. Um, herniated disc, muscle strain, nerve compression, spinal cord compression. You usually cannot see tumors unless it is a bony type of tum tumor. So while they can be helpful to some degree, we usually cannot tell patients something is wrong just from an x-ray image. 
All righty. So this is where we, we have now interviewed him. We've done an exam. He has a, he has a normal exam. He just has some muscle spasms when we, we look at him and it's time to educate this patient on low back pain. So it is the second most common reason people see a provider. The first is just for colds. So as I had mentioned to you guys, you'll probably deal with somebody who has back pain at some point in time. And it's helpful to know the initial steps in managing these patients and letting them know that it really is normal. It happens usually due to bending, twisting, and lifting injury, causing um, strain on the supportive spine, uh, musculoskeletal system, bony structures, and our discs. Um, it's important to understand that there are very, like, there are so many pain generators in the spine, so it's almost impossible to tell someone who has an acute back injury exactly what's causing their pain. If it's one of the their lat muscle or their paraspinous muscle, or maybe it was a, a ligament attached to the bone, um, or maybe it was the facet, which is the joint that kind of got irritated. There are a lot of things that can cause pain in the spine itself. We diagnose um, acute back pain with a clinical diagnosis. And that just means you really can look at them, hear the story, do an exam and make the diagnosis without ordering any labs or tests. So when someone has back pain in the first four to six weeks, we do not need to order any imaging or tests unless something is really a red flag symptom that's throwing us off saying, I need to investigate this a little further. So I would say, based on the history we got from this gentleman and that he was lifting at work, this sounds like just an acute um, back strain injury, which is probably the cause of why he's in so much pain. If someone comes back to you and tells you this injury, you know, was six or even over eight weeks ago, and they're still in severe pain, that's when you should start getting a little bit more concerned and, and doing a workup if they have not improved. And then you're thinking maybe they have a systemic disease. Maybe they've actually injured something to do with the, the disc or a herniation. Um, and we have to do a little bit further investigation. So you tell the patient all this, you're like, you pat yourself on your, your back, you tell them all of this stuff about back strain. And he's like, okay, cool. Uh, what are you going to do to treat me now? If this is, if there's nothing wrong with me and you don't order any tests, then what, what am we going to do about it? So conservative management is the foundation of back pain. And in this day and age, the medications we use to manage back pain are NSAIDs, which would be, um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. A lot of those are over the counter. Sometimes you can give um, patients prescription NSAIDs. It makes them feel a little bit better, and sometimes they're a little stronger. And sometimes we do do acute um, steroid packs, like a five-day taper of steroids, depending on their pain. Um, muscle relaxers and a lot of topical relief options, like there's Voltaren gel, um, lidocaine, things like that. There is no role for opioids in acute back pain anymore. Maybe... Um, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, anybody who came into urgent care or uh, the emergency room with a back strain, they were probably being given some form of opioid medication to handle it. And it has led to a lot of problems managing people's back pain um, as they age and went further on because now they're tolerant to pain medications. So now we really sparingly use it and you can actually deal with a lot of their pain with other mechanisms. Um, Usually back strain is an inflammatory process. So using anti-inflammatory medications helps their pain more than just an opioid, which is just blocking the cause of their pain. Um, the next is physical therapy. And a lot of back pain in people is from that they, if they have an injury caused by having poor core strength or body mechanics and what they do every day. Even if you have great body mechanics, if you're overweight or in the obese category, your spine is already working harder than someone who is a, a, of a normal BMI every day because it's carrying um, weight on the front of it that's caught putting more stress on your back. So a lot of people can be counseled on um, proper nutrition and exercise and core strength. They might give you a lot of groans and pushback to going to physical therapy, but it really can work wonders to learn how to properly take care of their back. Last one is manual adjustments. Um, you can definitely offer people the option to get massages, put hot and cold therapy on, see a chiropractor, 
And then the last thing is active rest. So they should keep moving, using their back and not overdo it. Listen to them if it flares up, but there's no such thing as bed rest or being immobile anymore for back pain. Um, similar to what I said, maybe 20 or 30 years ago when we were giving opioids, um, people were also put on bed rest. So they would throw their back out and then they would sit in bed for seven days and it didn't make anything better. We found people do get better the more you um, use use your back and get around. So, and the statistic is that 80% of these patients will uh, improve with conservative measures. So let's see some questions in here. At nine times out of 10, insurance requires PT prior to approval for further imaging and ortho. That is super true. I wasn't going to dial in a ton to um, insurance requirements, but if I want to get an MRI for my patient, say that this gentleman came to me at like week 12 with this pain, but he'd still done nothing, you would still have to do physical therapy usually for insurance to approve the imaging. Just one of the wonderful perks um, you'll learn in healthcare. Um, NSAIDs can make IBS worse. That is true. This is a gentleman maybe that we would counsel him on doing a steroid pack and some muscle relaxers. Orthotics are a great way to reduce back pain. It's amazing to see poor quality of footwear. Also extremely true. Um, especially when I see patients come into the office and, and flip flops and they have low back pain. Let's see what else. Would you educate them on smoking? Wouldn't smoking make back issues worse? Um, so I always counsel spine patients on smoking because it does make your bone quality worse. It also makes you a non-surgical candidate. You basically cannot have surgery um, if you're a smoker. It will be denied by insurance. But, on, but even to not be denied, you are definitely exposing yourself to less um, bone strength and overall poor health by smoking. The alcohol consumption be a point that can be brought up, especially regarding weight. Yeah, I I usually try in a very kind way when I'm um, educating them on nutrition and weight management and exercise to say that you know life is hard. We all have things that we use to choose to to deal with stress and get through you know the work week um, and maybe other factors in our lives. But you just have to do things in moderation and keep your body moving. So. I definitely would bring those up in a soft, a soft manner as well. But usually when people are in this much pain, you're kind of focusing on the angle and not doing too much, too much education to rub them the wrong way. So, all right, those were great questions for this slide. Let's go forward. All right, we are now on our patient number two. So this patient has severe back pain that radiates down their leg and has lasted for the last 10 days. <clears throat> They went to their primary care first, who ordered an MRI and said, you need to just go to a neurosurgeon's office ASAP. So on her intake form, here's how she fills it out. She's got right-sided back pain that radiates all the way down um, into her heel. Excuse me. <clears throat> For our history and physical exam, we have a 29-year-old female, and she has a BMI of 23.4. So young and healthy uh, is what it appears so far for her past medical history. She has just had two C-sections and an ACL repair 10 years ago. She has social alcohol use, never a smoker, and her occupation is that she is a full-time mom of two toddlers. Her medications, she just takes a daily multivitamin, and when she went to the primary care, they put her on a Medrol dose pack when she first um, came in with the severity of her symptoms. So we're gonna go back to that old charts for her history. Her onset was when she was lifting and twisting her four-year-old out of their car seat. The location is in their right low back all the way down their leg, like we said. Um, the duration has been constant for 10 days and it is sharp and stabbing down her leg. Um, any movement basically, bending, twisting, walking makes it worse. She said that the steroid pack did improve the severity of her pain and brought it down from like a 10 out of 10. So she is reporting that is a um, seven out of 10. And then, oh, I was gonna say, she said that this pain is less severe than labor, which is pretty frequent for women with back pain who will say that uh, labor was more painful than their back pain. And we already said it radiates down her right leg and that it is constant. 
So I peek over here on the right side to a dermatome chart, and this is um, super helpful and something that if you practice in spine, you'll, ha you'll have this memorized so you know what a, a nerve root a patient is talking about when they give you their symptoms. So as you can see, all of these are labeled with the level that the nerve root innervates in the skin. So dermatome tells us where people will feel pain, numbness, and tingling in their body. This does not correlate specifically to um, muscle groups innervated. That would be a myotome. But um, when someone's telling you where their pain is, you would use a dermatome map. So she told us it was on her right side in her buttock going all the way down into her heel. So you're thinking S1, S2 area here was what we'd be thinking for. Let's check on questions real quick. Everyone's saying sciatica, lumbar radiculopathy. Awesome. Perfect. Oh, a good question. The last one that says that if this could be spinal stenosis, um, spinal stenosis is a general term to describe narrowing in the spine, and it can be two things. So spinal stenosis can be narrowing of the central spine that holds your spinal cord and the cauda equina, which are the nerves at the bottom of the spine. And spinal stenosis can refer to the holes, those key holes we were talking about on x-ray. Um, those can get narrowed too. You have completely different symptoms usually if you have spinal stenosis in the middle of your spine versus spinal stenosis where a nerve exits. So unfortunately, we're not gonna go into um, regular spinal stenosis today. Um, but that is usually called neurogenic claudication and is seen in the older population with degenerative spine disease. All right, so we do a physical exam on her and she's reclining on the table when we walk in and she's extremely slow to sit up. She's like bracing herself, she's deep breathing. You can tell she's in a lot of pain. We ask her to do a motor exam and the one thing we notice is that when we have her dorsiflex, her right foot, foot, so bring it up towards her nose, she only has three out of five strength. So the grading scale is out of five and uh, three out of five means they can move their joint against gravity. But as soon as I put my hand on their foot <clears throat> to give them some resistance, she cannot resist my hand at all. She's truly weak in her foot. Um, for her sensory exam, she has decreased sensation along the posterior aspect of her leg in the same pattern over her pain. We ask her to get up and walk, and she's clearly in pain, and we notice she has steppage walking. So I'm just going to show you on this video what steppage walking looks like. So if you see this gentleman... With his right leg, he is over flexing his hip. He's like lifting his knee in the air. And that is because his left foot is not pushing off the ground. So that is what we call steppage gait. <clears throat> That's a pretty severe steppage gait right there. So we know that her foot is weak enough at this point where she can't even lift her foot up to walk properly. And the last exam finding we do is reflexes. They're all normal, but she has a little bit diminished reflex and the Achilles reflex on the right foot. Mm -hmm. Let's check questions real quick. No, this would not be caused by the ACL injury. Good question, but sometimes I, I put things in the, the patient's history to throw you off or make you think, but completely unrelated to her spine issue. All right, so we finally pull up the MRI that her PCP ordered for her and told her to come see us. And this is what we see. So in an MRI, we are looking at the sagittal view, which is as if the patient is cut in half and we're looking at them from the side of their body. And then this is the axial view. And that's as if you are um, sliced up and down, laying on a table, but we're looking up through their feet. That's important because the left is on the right side and the right is on the left, which is why it's usually labeled on an MRI. <clears throat> so we're looking here, we're counting at the sacrum. You always look, even though if you immediately look at this and you're like, oh, that's her problem, you still need to look at everything on an MRI. So I look at her sacrum, 
there's L5, L4. Okay. Her disc height's okay. She's got some, some arthritis, but doesn't look bad for being a 29 year old woman. Her discs are nice and healthy. You can tell that because they're bright, meaning they have hydration in them and, um, anything with water in it on, uh, MRI is going to be bright. So she has pretty healthy discs, but when we do get down here between L5 and S1, there's not really a brightness in here. And she has herniated a disc outward and you can see the kind of strands of her fiber, the, the cauda equina that are floating are being contacted by this disc herniation. So they're just placed backwards. You can't make a diet. You can make a diagnosis of disc herniation just by looking at this, but what matters most is looking at the axial view to see what the disc herniation is touching. So her disc herniation is kind of off to the right side and the hole, the neuroforamen is being uh, closed off. So this is like neuroforaminal stenosis, which is going to be pinching the right-sided nerve that exits there. The left side looks nice and open. The dorsal root ganglion is not being squeezed. So it's probably why she doesn't have any left-sided symptoms because the disc is not causing any problems over there. This is the central canal. The one that I briefly mentioned, you can have compression here and you'll get neurogenic claudication. And those patients present pretty, pretty differently. They have issues in bilateral legs. Um, they, their legs feel heavy. They have a lot of difficulty walking. Um, and that's just a different diagnosis in itself and usually a chronic condition. It's not often, um, acute. So the diagnosis is a disc herniation, as I've mentioned, and given that we see that it is touching the nerve root and it matches her symptoms, she can be diagnosed with lumbar radiculopathy. So that is the actual diagnosis that you would code because um, her imaging and her symptoms fit for radicular pain, which is pain that follows the pattern of a nerve root. So let's see, any other questions relevant? Could it be related to vaginal versus cesarean birth? That is a great question. Um, some women do have issues with their sacrum who have had vaginal births. However, the more likely reason is that she has been pregnant twice. So it doesn't matter that she's had a C-section. A woman who has had multiple pregnancies has laxity in their spine. So usually they're at higher risk um, of herniating their disc or throwing their back out because um, a lot of the hormones during pregnancy cause our um, ligaments to, to be looser to help with delivery. And they also lose core strength because they've allowed the pregnancy to push out on their transverse abdominis. So they have lost a lot of core support. So women who have had children, it's not uncommon for them to have back problems or to have a disc herniation. <clears throat> So would lumbar radiculopathy also cover neuroforaminal stenosis, blanket diagnosis? So neuroforaminal stenosis is not a diagnosis because um, it's not a clinical syndrome. So a diagnosis is something that is clinical. You would say this patient has neuroforaminal stenosis on their MRI reading. That was how that would be how you describe it, but it's not a diagnosis itself. Um, lumbar radiculopathy is the clinical picture she is presenting with because she has leg pain. Okay. Does that present soon after second child is born or later in life? Ligamentous laxity. So ligamentous laxity occurs um, with just the hormones of pregnancy that helps your, your pelvis widen and also helps you to like actually give birth. And then you're not lax, I guess, forever after giving birth, but because you've been lax once and you've stretched things out and you've lost um, core support, usually with your transverse abdominis, um, women are overall weaker in their core, especially if they don't continue to exercise through their pregnancy. So great question. <clears throat> Just a little terminology, because you will um, more than likely hear friends and family tell you about their spine also at some point in time. So there's normal discs, and then people can have degenerated discs, and that would be when you don't really have a lot of hydration um, in that disc space. And then they just kind of look gray on MRI, and they lose some height. That's a degenerated disc. 
Um, then you can have a bulging disc. This is important because if we took an MRI of all 80 of us in this um, webinar today, I would bet money that most of us have bulging discs in our back. Um, our discs bulge with age and um, depending on our occupations or what we do for hobbies, you can usually bulge a disc at some point in time. Sometimes these cause no symptoms at all. If, uh, often they really do cause no symptoms, but when someone has back pain and they've had an MRI, they will read on the MRI that you have a bulging disc and um, patients will assume that that is the cause of all their back pain. This is not necessarily the case. You can have bulging discs with absolutely no problem at all. And that, if, especially if that bulging disc isn't touching anything. So if it's not touching the nerve root, the cauda equina, or even the spinal cord higher up in the spine, it's not going to cause any problems. You're just predisposed to that disc being herniated later on. The last one is herniated disc, which we've already talked about when it's fully out of the disc space and is contacting um, either the CNS or the, the PNS, central or peripheral nervous system. And then thinning disc as well, pretty similar to degenerated disc. You can just have a, a thinned out disc that not necessarily um, associated with degeneration. <clears throat> see, check questions one more time. Was the disc superior to the hernia disc on the previous slide, a bulging disc? Great catch. I think you're right. Let's see. <clears throat> Absolutely. You guys are right. So you can see the edge of the vertebral body, the bone, and then there's a disc bulge outside of the vertebral body line. This is definitely a, a bulging disc. She probably actually could be categorized as having them at every level. So that's what I mean by when I say probably most of us have them. Um, it just happens with age. It's very normal. Are degenerative discs caused by unhealthy habits or do they come with age? How does one lose hydration in the disc? That is uh, the question we all would love the answer to. A lot of it is genetics. Um, a, lot, a lot of people are just uh, dealt, the po dealt a poor hand in the genetic lottery of spine health. So if you've had parents who had back issues and accelerated degenerative spine disease, you probably will be predisposed to that as well. Um, and then some people, it's just like their occupational hazard. You know, no one else than their family has had back issues, but they lifted and twisted and they gained weight and they smoked and they put a ton of uh, extra load on their spine for their whole life. Um, and so their spine looks that way. So um, losing hydration in the disc itself, just does, that does happen as we age, but the more fit you are and the more core strength you have to share the load with your spine, the less you lose the hydration in your discs. So um, by sharing the load of life um, with your core and your spine, your spine is happier. But the less you take care of your core, the more brunt of daily life your spine will carry. So if that makes sense, you kind of want to share the burden with the rest of your body. what can be done to improve disc health. So kind of just what I mentioned, but other than that, once your discs have started to degenerate, there is nothing to reverse that. You may see people talking about regenerating discs or offering um, alternative medicine therapies that will rehydrate discs. And there is nothing scientifically proven right now that you can regrow your disc. Disc material is made of a cartilaginous structure that has a fibrous ring and on the inside it is pulp. Um, and cartilaginous structures are avascular. So because they're avascular, they can't regrow. Can back, does back bend har harm spine health? I wouldn't say it harms spine health per se, but I will say patients I've seen who did gymnastics their whole life tend to have a little bit more back arthritis from the um, repetitive motions. It's not necessarily dangerous in its, in its own being. Um, can you reverse a herniated or bulging disc? Absolutely. Um, a lot of people actually who have um, bulging or herniated discs, it, it, that even causes leg pain. That's in the population of 80% of people who um, get better with doing no surgery. So our body can really like 
kind of re-suck in the pulp that has herniated back into the disc space, or it can heal and stay the same and not get any bigger. We don't understand why, um, but we do understand the, the body does a good job at trying to protect itself when you herniate a disc. Do you see more damage in people who are active at work versus people with disc jobs, people who spend a great amount of time sitting? Um, I will say, I don't necessarily, I wouldn't use the word damage, but they're each different. Uh, of course, people who are active in labor jobs, I think tend to have more spine arthritis or issues, but I really do see a lot of people who have back pain and stiffness because they don't move all day. So um, there's two sides to, to every coin, right? And the key is um, doing a little bit of everything in moderation. So uh, people who work at desk jobs, I, I do think have just as many back problems, like especially truck drivers, because they sit for such extended periods of time. So it, um, it, ha it does happen in both populations, definitely. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> Alrighty. So our second patient, her treatment is actually going to be surgery. Shocking enough. And that's why I wanted to talk about two patients today because acute back pain with a focal neurologic deficit is the one exception to obtaining imaging quickly and considering, um, surgical intervention. So even though she came in, um, with 10 days of disc herniation, when we examined her, um, we saw that she could not really lift her foot up and that is considered a focal neurologic deficit. So you don't mess around with that because, um, when a nerve root is pinched, usually the first thing people feel is pain. And then the longer it's pinched, it turns into paresthesias, tingling, um, sometimes numbness. And then usually the third thing that is damaged is the motor function. And once you get into a territory of a nerve being pinched to the point of motor, and um, sensory dysfunction, those are really hard to reverse and or they don't reverse at all. So when somebody has a neuro deficit, you want to fix that problem as quickly as possible, hoping that she'll get strength back in her foot or that she doesn't get any worse um, and that her function will stay the same. So um, this would be a, a case to think about if you don't even practice in spine and you have someone come in with acute back pain and you're like, I don't know, do I just send them with NSAIDs and a muscle relaxer, like, I, I don't know, do an exam, look at their strength and see if they have a, a neuro deficit in which you're like, okay, we need to escalate your care because clearly you have focal weakness. Um, the second thing, and this is probably one of the only red flag um, neurologic emergencies is cauda equina syndrome. So if a disc bulge um, or anything for that matter, disc bulge, tumor, infection, abscess causes the central canal, um, to become squeezed tight and it squeezes all of the cauda equina nerves. People will present with cauda equina syndrome. So the syndrome is that they have bowel or bladder incontinence. Um, they'll say that they just look down and they accidentally wet themselves or that they didn't notice that they defecated. Um, I've also seen people who say, I have not been able to urinate and like we bladder scan them and they have like a liter of urine in them. So I have seen the opposite of incontinence where they re that have retention. Um, they'll have saddle anesthesias and that just means there's numbness in the center of their thighs. So it kind of the, um, the, the pattern of which you would sit on a saddle for a horse, the inner parts of your thighs and your groin, um, will be numb. And then they will have pain and weakness in both legs. Um, sometimes people can't even walk at all when they have cauda equina syndrome. So um, these are just two things to think about when you're assessing someone with back pain, that if they have something that makes a red flag go off in your head, no one would ever fault you for doing a workup um, to preserve their neurologic function. Um, and right here on the side is one of the most common surgeries I do. I did like four of these on Tuesday is a minimally invasive lumbar discectomy. And that's just when you go in with a little tube, we actually perform surgery down like an 18 millimeter tube and, um, remove that herniated disc and pluck it out. Um, usually we're using a microscope, which you can't see at the top of this picture. We'll use a microscope to look down that, that hole and get the disc out. So 
Let's see. Let's look at questions again. <clears throat> According to your experience, would you say height is reduced from disc degeneration or bone degeneration? Um, both. <laughs> That's hard. You usually you don't have like significant disc degeneration if you also don't have bone degeneration. They kind of go hand in hand. Like usually people's vertebral bodies don't look pristine and then their discs look like crap. Like that is just not a thing. Uh, usually ov your overall spine health will kind of match in the bone and the the disc quality. <clears throat> Could herniated discs lead to autonomic dysreflexia? Um, this is a little bit of a wide catching question. It can, but that would be much more of a cervical spine issue when you're higher up where things are innervated um, that deal with like your diaphragm in the lumbar spine. No, that this would, that would have nothing to do with it. What do you replace the disc with when you remove it? Perfect question. Um, so if you're having a discectomy, we don't replace it with anything, actually. We just take out the part that is herniated. When you have surgery, you're accepting the risk that when we take that herniated disc out, we have dehydrated and uh, manipulated your disc so that it will be at an increased risk of degenerating sooner. So People who have back surgery are at increased risk of needing another back surgery in the future. So it wouldn't be uncommon for someone who had a discectomy to present 15 years later, and they have like a completely squashed disc, disc space in arthritis, and um, they would need then a, a lumbar fusion, um, which is, again, a very large different procedure and uh, explanation of why would we would perform a fusion on someone's spine. But we do not replace the disc with anything and it does not regrow. They plugged me with a steel artificial disc. So um, there are there is an option of having a lumbar and cervical arthroplasty um, where we can put in like a fake disc, but we usually don't do that just for an acute herniated disc. That's somebody who has advanced disc degeneration. And there's a lot of caveats to be a um, candidate to have a, a disc replacement. Uh, and usually they're very young, healthy people. Do the vertebra rub against each other? Yeah, that can happen. You can have your disc degenerate so much, actually, that your vertebra can grow together into one giant solid block of bone. It can get that bad. We call that auto fusion. Would a stenosis surgery help in these cases? Um, th this is a stenosis surgery. So yes, like this is, she has neuroforaminal stenosis secondary to a disc herniation. So we do go in there, remove a little bit of bone and remove the disc. All righty, let's go to the last. I think this is it. And then we'll answer questions. Anything, um, about my career and practice itself at the end. So a no on chronic back pain, because we are only talking about acute, um, chronic back pain is a beast of its own due to aging and genetics. Um, spondylosis is the, the medical term for um, spine arthritis and disc degeneration can cause significant pain and disability over time. Complaints of only back pain without leg symptoms become really difficult to manage as surgery is often not a solution for people who only have back pain. Usually if you have back pain, you have back surgery, you do not get better. So we, we try not to offer and explain that back surgery is not a solution just for back pain. Um, the best thing you can do as a provider in your future is counseling patients on proper body mechanics, using, um, um, maintaining their core strength, having great bone density, keeping up with their bone scans, um, as they age and staying active can slow and prevent the process. It is important to remember that somebody who has chronic back pain can have acute on chronic back pain if they develop a new leg symptom. So for example, I just saw a woman yesterday who has had back pain for like 50 years and she was 80 and um, she had a spinal fusion and has had back pain even after her fusion as she's aged. But in the last two months, she um, developed symptoms going into her right leg 
So that is acute on chronic back pain and we can treat the acute symptom of what caused her pain. So um, don't just write people off who tell you they've had back pain, you know, for 10 years. Um, a lot of people have pay attention to what the acute and new symptoms are going to be. So just wanted to show you guys, this is a CT on the left, and this is an MRI on the right of somebody with just horrible, <laughs> uh, disc, um, degeneration and spondylosis. So the end plates of their vertebra are all jagged. They have huge disc bulges. They got like no space here. Um, you can see that their lumbar lordosis, the the, the inward um, angle of their spine is exaggerated. This kind of happens when you're overweight and you carry more weight on the front of your body. Um, and you can see here that this person has like almost no disc over here and their vertebra are actually rubbing on each other in the back. So someone had a question like that and yeah, it can happen. These, there's osteophytes on this one too. So that's all I have for the clinical presentation. What other questions do you guys have before we finish up today? Thanks so much, Sarah. I'm looking in the Q&A box here, and I think we have one question about um, your schooling and your academic career. And it says, did you major in physician assistant studies, or did you major in another field and practice in medical assisting? Gotcha. So my um, progress or my um, career timeline was that I got an undergraduate degree, a bachelor's in neuroscience, just because it was a field I was interested in at the time. Um, did not know I was going to go into neurosurgery. Got that degree. Then for getting my patient care hours to apply to PA school, I worked on a neurosurgical step-down unit as a um, CNA. And I worked with that patient population, a lot of spine patients. And I learned a lot and really enjoyed it. So I had decided pretty early on that I wanted to um, help spine patients in my career. So then I got into PA school, which is a master's degree. So all PA programs are masters. There's a handful that are doctorate, but that's not the standard. Um, so you do major and uh, it is a master of physician assistant study degree. So that was a, a two and a half year program to get my PA school degree. Uh, after I finished PA school, I actually did a physician assistant fellowship, which is a new thing that a lot of PAs are electing to do on their own. Um, so I moved to Arizona, did a, um, a one-year fellowship in neurosurgery at Mayo Clinic. That is where I got a majority of my experience and knowledge on brain and spine. And then after I graduated from that program, I went into private practice neurosurgery. So as a um, private practice PA, uh, your job can vary based on the surgeon that you work with. But in my role, um, I see patients in clinic. I operate with the surgeon and assist in surgery. I round on the patients that stayed in the hospital in the morning, and I would do consults on patients who came into the ER um, having complaints that neurosurgery would be paged for. So I really did a little bit of everything. Um, Right now, I practice in North Dakota. I'm in a private practice group that only does spine. So I do um, spine clinic three days a week, and I operate in the OR with my surgeon two days a week. Thanks, Sarah. I see a couple of more questions in the chat as well. And this is going back to the patient case from today. How okay. do you feel about home curve correction for maintenance? So that's posture pumps manual traction, et cetera. Yeah, I think there's no harm in those. We frequently tell patients that if something makes you feel better, we're totally okay with it. Um, so a lot of people do inversion tables and hang upside down. Um, there's like cervical traction pillows people put on to extend their neck for neck pain. Um, all of that posture devices, they're all great. Um, so there's not really a lot of harm you can do in things that improve your core and your posture and reduce pain in your spine. The one thing we usually tend to tell people not to do, um, is to get adjustments of their spine. So we're not the biggest fans of chiropractic adjustments. You can go to the chiropractor and they can do like manual therapy and ultrasound and massage, um, and like dry needling. There's like a ton of things that chiropractors do, but um, sometimes I have seen worsened pain or injury from people who've had adjustments. So I, I typically 
tend to tell my patients not to have um, uh, cervical neck adjustments are a hard no. And lumbar is about 75% of the time I tell them not to. Thank you. And I see another question here. Would you recommend self-traction after rehab or regulated traction in the presence of a rehab specialist? Um, if you're a, if you're a patient who has not had surgery and there's nothing like implanted in your spine anywhere, there's no issue with self-traction and self-traction devices. Um, if you have a, you know, history of spine surgery or of spinal cord injury, that's where at those are the patient populations I deter from people doing therapies on themselves without a, um, like physical therapist or someone overseeing their care. Thanks, Sarah. Another question here asks, um, after PA school, what was the timeline between passing your pants to applying or being accepted into neurosurgery fellowship? Good question. Um, so neurosurgery fellowship or all PA fellowships have their own timeline because it's like kind of a job. So the acceptance, um, timeline for fellowships varies greatly depending on a program you're interested in. So I actually was, um, accepted to the fellowship program before I even took the pants. So I think I had interviewed and accepted with them in like June or July. And then I graduated from PA school in August. And then I took the pants in September. And then I started my fellowship the last week of September. So I knew I was doing fellowship before I had even passed boards. Thank you. And we have time for just two more questions. And the next one is, what is the patient population group that you work with mostly? Is it geriatric or younger patients? Um, my current patient population is anyone over the age of 18. Um, anyone under 18 is considered pediatric in the neurosurgery world. And they have quite a quite very diff different um, spine issues as adults. So I would not say uh, geriatric per se, but just my population is uh, adolescents and adult. Thank you. And lastly, what would you recommend for people who are interested in fellowships after PA school? That is um, my favorite thing to talk about. And I hope to do another webinar on it at some point this year. But if you think that you are interested in a fellowship and you've looked online at a program that offers them, um, set your sights early and talk to your PA program um, very soon on in your schooling to make sure you're set up for success to be a competitive candidate. What I mean by that is um, if you know you have to do a rotation in that specialty to apply to their program, make sure your program knows that and that you can rotate in that specialty during your clinical rotations. Um, if you know that you need three letters of rec and their application is due during the first year of PA school, make sure you have strong letters of recommendation and then you're keeping track of the timeline for the application while you're still in your didactic year. So, um, you really just can't fall behind and think that you want to do a fellowship at the very end, right before you're, you want to graduate. You kind of have to have it on your radar early on. Awesome. That is all the time we have for questions today. Thank you all so much for joining. And thank you, Sarah, for all the information that you have shared. If we missed any questions, please feel free to send your questions to our email and it is info at advancedclinical.org. And please be on the lookout for an email as well for 